Welcome to the Evening Review. My name is Ohana Klache, and joining us in studio is Lifeline International CEO, Ms. T. Tirida Pereira. Yes. Uh, did I say it correctly? Tilini Pereira. Tilini Pereira, my right. apologies. Not at all. Um, uh, and welcome to Namibia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been really wonderful to be in Namibia. It's my first time mm -hmm. and uh, everyone's been very welcoming. We had a great Namibian feast last night, so I got to taste the food and experience some of the culture um, and it's been really warm and inviting. Um, uh, just to sort of give us an introduction into the organization that you represent, well, what is Lifeline and um, uh, what is it the work, work that you do and what is it that you aim to achieve? Yeah, of course. So Lifeline International is a member-based organization. We have 26 members across 23 countries in the world and our collective shared vision uh, is a world without suicide. And our mission is to ensure that quality suicide prevention services are available um, accessible and encouraged in countries around the world. So our members are amazing. They do um, life-saving work on the ground in countries. Um, the core sort of focus and where they do that is through the provision of a crisis helpline. And that is a line that people who are feeling distressed uh, or experiencing a crisis can actually call at those times to receive help when they need it the most. Uh, most of our members also deliver community-based suicide prevention work, like training the community to identify the signs of someone experiencing that distress and to refer them on to get help. So our job at Lifeline International is to actually support our members to deliver these services. And we do that through a couple of different ways. Uh, knowledge sharing, um, you know, sometimes financial support through advocacy, uh, using our members' um, voices to elevate that on a platform globally to shape global policy around suicide prevention. Um, so these are the ways that we support our members, but really they're the heroes. They do all the work on the front lines to save lives every day. Mm. And then um, I would understand that um, uh, there's currently a Lifeline um, Africa um, Region Forum taking place. Yes. Um, the, what are the aims of the of, of, of the forum, and just to give us a, a scope of the of of, of, of the, 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 the what is the significance of this forum? It's a very important moment for us as a member network. You know, for nearly two years, the the lifelines across Africa have been meeting, you know, on Zoom, on Teams, online every quarter, not really having the opportunity to come together in person. Um, you know, due to a number of reasons most notably the pandemic where we couldn't all travel, um, but also resourcing and, and different issues as to why we couldn't meet in person. So this is a really significant moment because it's the first time that we've all come together in person to actually work on um, shared challenges and opportunities in suicide prevention. And we're so pleased that Lifeline Childline Namibia um, volunteered to host um, this gathering where uh, Lifeline South Africa, Lifeline Botswana, uh, Lifeline Malawi, um, the Ghana Association for Suicide Prevention, um, Lifeline Zambia, Lifeline, we're all here together, Lifeline International, um, uh, for the first time in a very, very long time in person. And the aim of coming together was really a couple of different things. Firstly, to create a space for knowledge sharing and peer learning, um, to strengthen links within the region. You know, um, there's not enough resourcing all the time to duplicate efforts. So when we can build once and share often, we often you know, want to do that and take that option. Uh, the other thing is about sharing and developing together policy solutions, sharing best practice, and identifying opportunities that we can work on together to advance suicide prevention in our respective countries. Mm. Um, we're also pleased to be joined by the Africa CDC. Um, they've come along to, to understand from Lifeline the work we're doing and how that community-based um, support and community-based health actually works and fits in uh, with the wider system. We've had representatives from uh, Namibia's Ministry of Health and Social Services join us. So it's been a very productive uh, two days so far, understanding the stats and the, um, I guess, the, the trends in, in deaths by suicide within the region, within the sub-regional trends, and here in Namibia as well, 
and working out strategies for the future. Mm. Um, you mentioned um, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, mm -hmm. how it limited uh, the, the sister organizations um, from meeting. Uh, from that aspect, because um, there was no, there was there were no means to meet in person. Mm -hmm. How would you say uh, um, it affected the work of Lifeline to sort of try and prevent um, um, suicides because of the fact that people were in isolation? Yeah, I think I think there's two things. Firstly, um, for us as as member organisations, certainly it's always better to meet in person where we can rather than always online. The online's a good sort of alternate and, and a gap filler at times but there's nothing like really coming together and spending that time and dedicating that time for strategic purposes um, because the energy in the room is different the problem solving um, is sometimes quicker in some ways because we're able to discuss and um, have that open and honest dialogue um, separately in terms of the pandemic and the demand for services it was a very busy time in every country for services like ours because once people were uh, in isolation, they weren't often going in person to receive help. Mm -hmm. So often digital means became the access point of the day. So I know a lot of our members told us that during that pandemic, we saw an increase in demand for crisis support services because whether it was people were anxious or in isolation, they were reaching out for help. Which, by the way, we think it's a good thing when people are encouraged to reach out for help. Mm. Um, part of coming together is to talk about what have we learned through the pandemic and ways of working that we can carry forward into a post-pandemic world. Um, certainly it's not always ideal to do things online, but there's probably a hybrid model that we can use moving forward. Mm. And then um, <clears throat> the, 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 there were recent figures um, um, showing um, how Namibia is dealing Mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, with the issue of suicides and and, yep. uh, and um, highlighting Namibia as probably having 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 a very very negative um, um, situation, um, how do you how do you think um, Lifeline Namibia can step in and to help um, government and to help other mm -hmm. civil society organisations deal with this issue of suicide? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that in any country, um, having a national suicide prevention strategy and policy is important because it is the best way to have a coordinated approach to addressing a challenge like suicide, mm. um, particularly given the numbers that you've alluded to. Um, I understand here in Namibia that that um, suicide prevention strategy is being created and Lifeline Namibia is part of that process. And I, we commend um, you know, the ministry for doing that. I think it's really important to get a number of people involved in the development of a strategy like that, whether it's uh, you know CSOs, um, service providers, people with lived experience. Mm. I think all of these stakeholders have to come together to inform how we can have a coordinated approach to address um, suicides in the country. And I think that it's happening. I know that Lifeline Namibia has been at those meetings and contributing um, their knowledge and expertise as a service provider and what they're hearing you know, and understanding from communities as well. So I think that's the first step. Um, I also think in any um, strategy, it's good to have really clear goals on what we're going to do and how we're going to measure success. So to do that, we need sort of data monitoring, um, data gathering and monitoring systems to know that once the strategy is place, in place, um, they were actually monitoring for success. Have we hit the goals that we're hoping to achieve in this strategy? Um, and finally, I would be remiss if um, I wouldn't give a shout out to crisis helplines. You know, we believe there's a role for crisis helplines to play in national suicide prevention strategy. The role of service delivery to ensure we're encouraging people proactively to reach out and seek help. When someone calls a crisis helpline, they don't always have to be feeling suicidal. Mm. You can be experiencing distress. You can be experiencing crisis. We encourage you to reach out because we can help with de-escalating the crisis so it doesn't get to a dire point. So I think having a national suicide prevention strategy and policy, which I know um, the government is working on, engaging a wide range of stakeholders, CSOs, people with lived experience to shape those um, policies and activities is important monitoring and evaluation, and of course, the role of crisis helplines. Um, well, I want to shift, um, I want to speak more on suicide, but um, as any other platform, we have to pay bills, so we'll take a short commercial break.
to another exciting episode of Iran World Talk. We bring you all the news to hear and to tell what we are about first. Here in Montreal, I'm back. We are so excited to be kickstarting your morning with the entertainment. Everything was happening mm. during this past weekend. Yes. Exciting news. Wow, no, she was killing it already. In my opinion, I don't see anything wrong with him serving the full term. As well as keeping you informed on the issues that you need to know happening in and around our country. Welcome back to the Evening Review. Um, we, we are coming out of a pandemic period where people um, may have contemplated suicide as a consequence of either losing their jobs, um, incomes are having been affected, um, this lack of access to other people, um, being in isolation. Do you, have, you seen, have you seen the situation improve in terms of reigning in the number of suicides as, as a result of of, 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 of these um, lockdown measures now being um, um, uh, relaxed a, a bit? Look, I think, uh, you know, the pandemic was basically unprecedented con times, right? We've never experienced anything like it ever. And I think people had to really learn how to cope in those extraordinary circumstances. What we know at the time was that in some ways um, the pandemic brought forward a very necessary conversation around good mental health and suicide prevention. It actually brought a focus on it that has not been there before in most countries, in most communities, and more of an awareness of us as individuals of the need to look after not just our physical health, but our mental well-being as well. So in, in I guess, one sense, um, the pandemic really escalated and accelerated that focus that was really needed mm. on looking after suicide prevention and, and, and mental health. So we saw then that in that time, there's also more of a focus of people um, and governments encouraging people to reach out for help. And so we then received an increased demand in most countries for our services around the crisis helpline. We think that's a good thing, right? And I think while, um, while the pandemic restrictions have eased in most countries. There are other challenges now in the world. You know, in some places there are wars, the cost of living is high in most countries. The social and economic challenges, I think, in most countries continue to exist in different forms, either as a result of the pandemic or due to new issues coming up. So I think the reality is we will expect to see demand for services, suicide prevention, crisis support services continue, and so it should. We will always encourage people to reach out for help. It's better to reach out and receive that help rather than contemplate that in silence um, and lead to dire outcomes. So I think the pandemic was a really interesting exercise of fast tracking, you know, the conversations that we really needed to have as communities around suicide prevention, around um, mental health and ensuring that there was a focus on reaching out for help. Mm. Um, what would you list um, and looking at this picture holistically, what would you list as being among the biggest challenges for organizations such as yourself in dealing with this issue of um, um, suicides? Look, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. Firstly, uh, you know, in some countries, look, in 40 countries around the world today, a suicide remain, attempted suicide and suicide remains a crime. So that is a legislative, um, you know, barrier to seeking help in our view. There are also other barriers to seeking help. Sometimes the help is available, but barriers exist that don't let people actually reach the help mm -hmm. that they need. That is a challenge because we can put services out there, we can ensure there are people available to answer the call, but there could be a couple of reasons people aren't calling. There's a barrier to seeking help, people don't know about it, or actually stigma that people don't want to be seen to be accessing help. Mm. So these are key things that we need to work through because we need to encourage people to seek help, raise awareness, and we need to normalize reaching out for help. You know, we all, both of us, you know, both, we, you would have good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. I have good days and bad days. You know, we were just talking uh, in the Lifeline Forum earlier today. It's sort of a pendulum, right? There's when you're well and whole and not feeling sick and then there's this end of the spectrum where sometimes you're not feeling well. No one's ever on 
one side completely. We're all swinging. There are days that we are really, really well, and there's days that we might not be feeling the best version of ourselves or feeling sad or feeling like we can't cope. We all have that. So we need to be able to have that conversation openly, remove the stigma around saying, hey, I need help, and then not feeling bad about accessing it. You know, earlier today, my colleagues from different parts of the co uh, continent were saying that if someone's going in to see their psychologist or their psychiatrist, they're quickly checking left and right on the street to make sure no one's seeing them going in. Um, that is a challenge in every country in the world. We can't say that stigma doesn't exist. We have to each do our part to normalize reaching out for help. And these are some of the issues we have to encounter to ensure we can get people to access the service to receive the help they need. Um, there's a movement growing particularly, uh, maybe not so popular in this part of the world, but in general, um, in the developed world of assisted suicides. Mm. How much of a how much how much of a how much of a how much how much of a how much of a bearing does that have on the work that Lifeline does? We haven't really participated in that discussion. You know, our job is to ensure that the service is available to people who need it, and we will always be there to support people in crisis. Our focus has largely been around the decriminalisation of suicide, and I know that that has been contentious because people think we're glorifying suicide or sanctioning uh, it by removing the, dec you know, by decriminalizing it. That is actually a very misunderstood issue, right? In 40 countries around the world today, someone, you know, sitting there is feeling like they can't reach out and say, I'm experiencing these thoughts because they have fear of being sanctioned or receiving a penalty or being prosecuted. Hmm. We know that there are some countries, even very recently, where someone attempted to take their life and was prosecuted and put in jail. That is not giving people the help that they need. It's a cry for help. We need to actually remove and change those laws so that we can actually ensure that people are feeling that they can reach out for help. Um, we just heard this week um, at, at our con uh, forum from uh, the Ghana Association for Suicide Prevention. So the government uh, in Ghana recently decriminalized suicide um, a couple of months ago. So the team from there was sharing the journey they've been on. Mm. Because, and the effect of having a decriminalized suicide in that country is that it also shifts the conversation about stigma. How can you reduce stigma if something is a crime? So they're on a really interesting journey and they shared those learnings with us over the last um, couple of days. They're on a journey of decriminalizing the law, removing, st you know, working hard to remove stigma and putting in a coordinated strategy in place. And now we're working with them to set up a helpline, a crisis support helpline in Ghana, mm. um, so that people can access that help. So our focus really has been about the legislative changes around decriminalizing suicide, how we remove that barrier, how do we get people that, the help that they need. Um, we're actually getting ready to launch a global campaign in October. Um, to decriminalize suicide across the 40 countries in the world where it is a crime. Uh, and we hope to receive the support of a number of communities around the world as a movement that we need to elevate this conversation and look at change in legislation. Mm. Um, having now visited Namibia, um, uh, and I, I wouldn't know to what extent you've been able to, to, to assess the situation on the ground, but in terms of the tools and the and the, and and, uh, and the, the, that lifeline Namibia has its yeah. at, at its disposal, and the fact that government is looking at launching a strategy, um, how would you rate uh, the the effect of how would you uh, rate the effectiveness of government or lifeline Namibia? Do you think um, are you satisfied with work done to to combat suicides? I think there's always the challenge is so large. There's always going to be more that needs to be done. But I have to say I was really pleased to see ministry officials present um, at this meeting, really engaged in conversation and the work and learning from other countries. Um, so I think there's a lot to like there in terms of what is happening. And um, I saw a real commitment um, from the individuals who were present from the, from the ministry. Um, the deputy executive director was there yesterday. I had the opportunity to meet with your deputy um, minister for um, health and social services uh, a couple of weeks ago as well. So definitely I have witnessed in those conversations a commitment to um, advancing suicide prevention. 
I can't speak to all of the aspects of it because I haven't spent a lot of time on the detail, but certainly in the conversations I've had, I've felt very positive about that. In terms of Lifeline Childline Namibia, I have to say um, all of the countries present today were really heartened to hear about the amount of work that's happening. It's not just the helpline, right? It's also education. They're working with schools, with young people, to actually equip them early in life to be able to be resilient and to have coping skills. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. They seem to be working across all aspects of the community. And I think, again, that's really important because suicide doesn't discriminate. You know, you could be any age, you could be in any part of the country, you could be in any community and be experiencing a crisis. So I've been really pleased to see Lifeline Childline and Namibia working across a huge spectrum, both geographically and socially across the community and engaging the community in that work. I think there's also some social um, and cultural factors that, you know, in every country will play in to um, suicide prevention. And I've seen Lifeline Namibia, Namibia seeking to address that. So I think not just providing the crisis line, but providing education to the community, gatekeeper training, um, working with officials, being integrated into the health system and um, other social services. So I see a real effort to do this as a coordinated effort. Mm. And I think that's mostly, that's most important because we can never go it alone. The challenge is too big. We have to work together. Mm. And then, um I think just in closing, uh, for the layperson, uh, for mm -hmm. the untrained eye, um, I'd, I'd like to combine this question. Mm -hmm. what, what does one look out for, um, for example, a family member or a friend or yeah. a colleague who might be suicidal? Mm -hmm. And how does, how, 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 how does one shape yourself to assist this person not to commit suicide, but also not say something or do something yeah. that could trigger this person to, yes. to want to attempt suicide? It's a very good question and I think again um, as a community we need to spend more time on, on how we identify these signs. But for my end I think uh, usually people are actually giving us signs along the way. They're not always keeping it hidden because people are actually inherently want to survive usually, right? So the signs might be if that someone is extroverted or outgoing usually and they're extremely quiet or you've noticed a change in behaviour um, or personality, I think you should ask, you know, is everything okay? You've seen a bit different to usual, are you okay? I think it's okay to ask the question directly, are you okay? Mm. Often you'll be surprised, people will open up if you ask. I think we just don't usually want to ask because we think people want to be private or not share that. But I think you should ask directly, you know, are their usual habits changing? Are they eating a lot, not eating at all? Um, if they exercise a lot usually, but they're you know, staying indoors or, or can't get out of bed in the morning. All these changes in behavior and habits, I think if we notice that in someone close to us, we should ask the question. Yeah. And we should ask it directly. Are you feeling okay? Is everything okay? Do you want to talk about something? Um, if not me, would you like me to connect you with someone who could have a conversation with you? And normalizing reaching out for help. Um, you know, encourage, and I think at that point, providing a referral into an organization like Lifeline that can provide that support is important because not every person might feel like they can have that conversation. That's okay. Take it to the point that you ask the first question, are you okay? No, I'm not. Okay, do you need help? Can Let me connect you with someone who can actually help, either Lifeline or a local service provider, um, whoever that might be then you provide that referral and you make sure they actually use the referral to get that help. Mm -hmm. So I think having those conversations, taking the time out to ask people if they're okay, taking the time to observe what's happening with our friends, our loved ones, our co-workers, I think noticing these changes in behavior or attitude or um, habits is important and asking the direct question. I think sometimes they're very busy in today's world. Mm -hmm. You might come into work I'm guilty of this, you're guilty of this, we, we rush around. You might not spend time even asking your coworker, how are you going this week? Has it been a really tough week? Or if you know it's been a particularly difficult time, you should reach out. If someone's being diagnosed with um, an illness or is feeling unwell, reach out and ask, because you don't know how far that could go for them. Thank you so much for joining us on the Evening Thanks Review. Thanks for having me. And uh, we, uh, the, we, on behalf of the Evening Review team, wish you a pleasant flight back to Australia. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been an absolute delight being in Namibia, but also experiencing different parts of the continent, and I hope to come back very soon. Thank you for tuning in. Good night.